Dale. And soon we're going to be talking with the amazing Monique Fairchild, who has so many letters by her name, I can't even keep them all straight. <laughs> and we're gonna be talking about, I, I think Liz, I, I wanna talk about how veterinary nurses and technicians, it was National Nurses Week recently, last week, right? And, or Nurses Day, maybe both. Uh, veterinary nurses are absolute heroes in all this. Cer certainly veterinarians, people that work in the front office, but I would argue, especially the nurses, I wanna talk about that. Uh, Monique is a specialist in behavior. There are such a thing, there is such a thing among nurses and the cool, the, these uh, veterinary technicians and nurses have gotten together to do the coolest thing in the world that we'll talk about as well. But I know you and I wanna chat about something first. Yeah, so before we bring Monique on, I wanted to talk quickly about um, really big news that came out today. So as scientists, we really wanna know fact-based information. And then as a veterinarian, it's my job to make sure that I deliver that fact-based information to my clients and to the public. So today, it was today, the 13th of May, although it's I'm turned around about dates anymore, they all run into each other. But on the 13th of May, that's today, the New England Journal of Medicine released a paper uh, stating that there was a study that had evidence that cats could transmit the coronavirus to each other. So that is SARS-CoV-2, the, the virus that causes COVID-19. So to be 100% clear, what we know so far is that people can give it to cats. Now cats can give it to each other. There is no evidence that cats can give it to people. But with a novel virus, it's our job to stay on top of the data and to report what we know as soon as we know it. There is no reason to get rid of your cat right now. I'm listening, there's no reason to get rid of your cat. There's no reason not to adopt a cat. But for me, I have a cat named Phoebe and she's gonna stay inside. I normally keep her inside anyway, to be truthful, but you know, they, they could get it from each other if they're in close contact outside. And I don't want that. And Steve, you had some experiences today with people that get upset with that information. Yeah, you know, so, uh, and by the way, friends, I hope you do comment and I invited people uh, on my Facebook page who were upset at me to ask me questions. I hope I hope you do. Uh, yeah. Although that's, I, I, I certainly do wanna talk to Monique in a minute. Um, there are some things, so I'll, I'll even pull back on some of what you're saying. So it's no surprise that cats can give it to other cats. People such as yourself, virologists who have studied this, we're expecting a study to come out to indicate that. Uh, and after all what happened in the Bronx Zoo, although <laughs> lions and tigers are not domestic cats, it is likely that they gave it to one another. There was community spread, if you will, among yep. the cats of the Bronx Zoo. So it originally came and it can only, as far as we know, originally come from a human being, but then once the cats get it, it is potentially, it can happen. We don't know yet if it can easily happen. It seems it can't because there haven't been a lot of instances of this. We don't believe that the cats get very sick, oftentimes not sick at all. And therefore, if not sick at all, you don't know what you don't test. So and that's, a lot you don't know. that's a really important point is that the cats really often show no clinical signs or mild upper respiratory signs. And just like humans with a cold, there's lots of things that can give a cat mild upper respiratory signs. So while this, um, you know, I, I heard the expression that we are learning to fly our plane in midair um, with a novel virus. We just don't have those years and years and studies and studies of history to be able to say what's going on and why to be able to predict how things are going to go in the future. We're learning as fast as we can. And Steve, I think it is our job to make sure that we report the facts and the studies as they unfold. I can't agree more. And, you know, science is supposed to be what we follow. And that information ultimately, ultimately will save animals is the thing. The other thing is the people in my experience uh, and from what I understand around the country, truly, there may be individuals here and there, but people are not giving up animals happily because there's no reason to no. out of concern that dogs or cats uh, are going to 
get COVID-19 and give it to one another or give it to us. They are beginning to give up animals in some cases because yeah. they don't have, and I understand this, a plan. Yeah. There aren't family members who can take animals uh, when people get very sick. In many cities, there are shelters that will participate, including my own city in Chicago, and take these animals. But there needs to be a better infrastructure, if you will, for that. And those facilities can fill up. That's not happened yet, to my knowledge. That has been a bigger issue. Or people out of work who no longer can afford their animals. Those are bigger issues. And those are real issues. This is just emotional, made-up stuff. Anyway, let's go on because we've yeah. got an amazing guest. All right, I'm going to bring her on. Uh, without further ado, please welcome Monique Fairchild. Well, let's applaud Monique then. And you know what, Monique? I want to put myself back in the middle. So I'm going to go away and come back. It's like a magic trick. Oh, she's amazing. And while she does that, <laughs> I will say that veterinary nurses or veterinary technicians are heroes every day. And I don't believe that most of your clients, Dr. Bales, as a veterinarian, know even half, really, of what technicians or nurses do on a day-to-day -day basis. And now, through all of this, they are, in some ways, I would argue, putting themselves out on the line, hopefully not in danger, because people like Monique are trained in this area about protecting themselves if they have the proper PPE, et cetera, to do it, but, but they know how to do it, still putting themselves out on the front lines every single day for every single day for us and every single day for companion animals. And, and one more thing in the speech here, if it were not for, it sounds like I'm making a speech, doesn't it? <laughs> but truly, and I'm running for office and for the president <laughs> of technicians, even though I'm not one. But, but absolutely true that if it wasn't for veterinary nurses, veterinary technicians, the cost of veterinary medicine would be absolutely sky high. The, the level of care that we get would not be what it is today in this country. And solely that is because of the technicians and nurses that go unsung every single day. And Monique, I'm gonna add one more bit of praise that will heap on you tonight. <laughs> I have never met a more devoted, caring, kind, um, the technicians that I have worked with in my career would do anything for their pets, anything for your pets, not their pets, for your pets. Um, I think that it, you are the most kind, amazing group of people. And um, I'm one of my things that I'm into right now is helping the helpers. Um, and you guys are among the world-class helpers. So without further ado, Hi, Monique, we'll let you talk now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I couldn't be happier to be here. I'm thrilled. And I'm happy to take all the compliments you have to give on the behalf of technicians and nurses everywhere. I am super proud of what we do. I'm proud of my colleagues. We have an amazing profession. And it's not just a job. It's who you are. Uh, people ask me how I describe veterinary technicians. And I say half ninja, half unicorn is my <laughs> description I of like veterinary that. technicians. I like because that. we do everything, you know, we do everything and we deliver it on a schedule that is totally unbelievable. And we care 110 percent of the time we're here to be. So the what, what, what is a technician that specializes in, in your case, it's behavior. But if you could rattle off some of the specialties, because I don't know. First off, that most people know all of what technicians or nurses do. And secondly, that the specialties for your profession even exist. Absolutely. You know, veterinary technicians, we have specialties just like veterinarians do or just like physicians do. And these are subsets of clinical practice. So there is emergency and critical care technicians, dentistry technicians, anesthesia and analgesia, cardiology, internal medicine, equine nursing, canine and feline clinical practice. There are, I think, 18 altogether at this point, academies of veterinary technicians. And each one has a rigorous process by which you accumulate experience in your area of specialty, a rigorous examination process that you have to take, and then you have to maintain your continued education on an ongoing basis and recertify every five years. So it really is an intensive process to make sure if somebody has their veterinary technician specialty, you know that they really are the expert 
in that particular subject matter, but we're technicians first. So while I'm a behavior technician, that doesn't mean that I'm an animal trainer. It means first I'm a veterinary technician and I do all the veterinary technician stuff. I work full time in day practice. So, you know, I do radiography and dentistry and anesthesia and emergency and preventive medicine and client communication and answer the phones and make appointments. I do all those things that veterinary technicians do. And then I also have advanced training in behavior to work with those special needs that patients and clients and families particularly have. Uh, our job, you know, as veterinarians and veterinary technicians, it's not just about the animals. Uh, the sort of secret they don't tell you when you go into veterinary medicine is that this is a people business. Mm -hmm. And we are here for the whole family, not just for the animal, because uh, families are what make animals go. You know, veterinary medicine doesn't exist without clients. And our job is to keep families healthy and happy together. So. And Monique, you've been in practice for more than 20 years. Is that right? I uh, will neither confirm nor deny that. <laughs> you started when you were five. But um, in that case, yes. <laughs> how long did you practice before you got your uh, specialty in behavior? Uh, let's see. Let's do some advanced math. <laughs> uh, the, the specialty of behavior was actually recognized in 2010. Okay. Um, I've been in practice since 1997, and I certified as a behavior technician in 2011. So, oh, so you are why behavior, Monique? I'm sorry? Why behavior? Why behavior? Oh, man. So be really, before I was a technician, I was a trainer. And so I had a lot of background in behavior going into my career as a veterinary technician. And early on in my career, I had sort of a formative experience performing a behavior-related euthanasia of a young, healthy dog for a family. And it really changed my understanding of what families need from the veterinary community with respect to the behavior of their animals so that they can remain safe and everybody can sort of stay together forever. Like the heartbreak of that family really touched me in a deep, meaningful way that sticks with me even now. I mean, that was probably in 1998 and I still can get a little like, Steve's trying to make me cry. I'm like, really, Steve? But <laughs> it's, it's so important, you know, and every... You know, animals behave all the time. Behavior and nutrition, we have this like uh, <laughs> happy rivalry because they say well, everything's got to eat. And I say, well, they have to find the fork here. They have to find it first. <laughs> so, and you know, animals finding food is like my most favorite topic in the that world. You. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I think people don't appreciate also when they go into the veterinary hospital, the amount of training that the technicians have had and I mean, just even to get through a day physically, it's a very rigorous job physically. It is a very rigorous job intellectually. You guys are doing drug doses and you're trying to also think about what each different veterinarian that you work with is gonna want and need before we get in the room. And what I learned, which was amazing, is not every veterinarian communicates just like me. Who knew? So <laughs> when, it, when I only have to deal with me, you have to deal with all the different doctors that you work with and make sure that you're meeting all their needs. And meanwhile, something that we don't talk about really enough, I don't think, and um, Melinda made a comment about how immensely underpaid most veterinary technicians are. And I want to shine a light on that because um, I don't know that there's an easy answer. If there was, we would have fixed it by now. This is an industry where everybody's suffering financially, like everybody actually, the clients, the vets, the technicians, the receptionists, everybody's suffering. But I don't think people understand just how little technicians get paid. Yeah, I don't know. I, no, go ahead. I don't know what, well, I don't know what, like, I don't know that I set you up for an answer there. <laughs> I just wanted to point it out because it's really um, shocking actually. Yeah. And, you know, it's tough because we are trying to find that balance between being able to provide care, which means making it approachable and reachable enough that clients are empowered to say yes and accept treatment and also being able to eat. And there's no shame in being financially solvent. Like it's okay. It's okay to charge for your time. It's okay to do a good job. And it's okay to demand that you are financially safe, especially in such a skilled profession. And it's like you say, there's so many factors. If we could have solved it easily, it would already be solved, right? But 
veterinarians are no exception to that. Like the DTI, the debt to income ratio a veterinarian has when they come out of school with student loans that are larger than most mortgages and they're making 70 grand a year. Like that just. I think that's something people don't understand either that, um, sorry, my dog is expressing his opinion about the situation. Well, you can fix that. <laughs> but I think people, and how would you know? But um, many veterinary uh, graduates who are graduating this weekend next um, will, even if they work full time, may not be able to afford rent. They may have to go home and live with family to be e able to afford to work and pay back their loans. I'm going to let Plankton vacate my premises. I'll be right back. Okay. So, uh, Monique, while that happens, I do have questions to ask you. I'm curious as to if you're seeing anything different now in the pets, dogs and cats, that you typically do as far as anxiety because of our lives being turned upside down? Or are things about the same? I'm talking about the emotional well-being. Are things about the same? Or have you seen a difference? It's really interesting because I think that we are seeing increased recognition by clients because everybody's home looking at their pets right now. And with respect to the anxiety question that you asked or the behavioral changes question that you asked, I'm getting more questions from clients about their animal's behavior and what's going on with them, as well as more medical questions. You know, we are getting lots of telemedicine consultations, lots of questions to answer on the phones. The phones are busier than they have ever been. Uh, right now. And I think it's partially because people are spending a lot more time at home with their animals and they're learning more about them. See, is this mm. normal? Is this abnormal? Is he supposed to do this? What's he doing? What's happening? Well, <laughs> probably he does that every day. It's just that you're not home to see him do it. And yes, that's normal or no, it's not. And we need to work together to find a solution and work it up. Or, but I wouldn't say that I've necessarily seen an uptick of actual anxiety cases, but I've certainly seen an uptake in recognition on the part of the client that maybe something's going on. Well, I think that's a good thing. How about in the clients? Have you seen uh, an increase in anxiety level there? Or again, is it really about the same? Uh, no, I would say that at least in our practice, I can't speak for everywhere, right? Like I'm just in my bubble where I go every day, but uh, our clients are super stressed. You know, I think it's really hard to be human right now. Like this is just a hard time to be a person and get up and put your pants on or not and go to your job or not. Like the struggle is real right now, just yeah. one foot in front of the other. And certainly we're seeing that expand into the veterinary clinic for sure. Um, we see a lot more like emotions are a lot closer to the surface for clients right now. Things that they might've been able to take in stride or things that feel relatively minor to us seem to really impact them. So we've been working really hard to treat everybody with just a little bit of extra consideration, a little bit of extra generous assumptions. And, you know, uh, I'm finding we're getting more clients being touchy about things that are a surprise to us. And I have to remind myself, you know, this probably isn't about me. It's yeah. probably not about us. It's probably not even about the pet. It's just about life is really hard right now. Yeah. And they deserve the compassion and understanding that I can find for them. And they also deserve me setting a healthy boundary for myself about, what's their stuff and what's my stuff. And whether I take that home with me or not is up to me, ultimately. Yeah. So. Well, if there are behavior questions, if you have questions about, uh, as Monique has frozen, uh, <laughs> once she comes back with us, if you have questions about uh, your pets, uh, we would love to hear those questions and Monique can answer them and Dr. Bales can answer them and I could read them and fill in the blanks on all that too. I know you were an early supporter, uh, Monique, of Fear Free. Uh, why did you jump on board so early? And I suppose we can't assume that people know what this is and we have to back up a step and explain what Fear Free is all about. Sure, so, well, Steve knows what Fear Free is all about and so does Dr. Bales, but I'm happy to talk about Fear Free as much as you want me to. Um, Fear Free Pets, you go to their website if you're a pet owner, fearfreepets.com or Fear Free Happy Homes is also out there, fearfreehappyhomes.com. There's tons of information about what Fear Free does, but Fear Free is essentially an educational program for veterinary professionals and for pet owners. 
that teaches them how to be aware of the emotional welfare of animals and how to protect their emotional well-being when they're in our care, both as clients and as veterinary professionals. Uh, in veterinary school and in technician school, we teach a lot about medicine. We teach us how to diagnose. We teach us how to treat. They teach us how to calculate CRIs and how to interpret ECGs and how to position radiographs. But they don't necessarily always take the time, at least in the past, this is changing now, but in the past, not necessarily as much time was taken for how to do those things in a way that makes sense for the animal and in a way that takes into account what the animal experiences, what they see, what they hear, what's happening with that animal inside their mind while we're trying to treat their body. And that matters. You know, veterinary medicine, we have, um, it, uh, Dr. Marty Becker is the founder of Fear Free, and he says we're the only profession that has 100% expectation of on-the-job related injuries <laughs> because things like bites and scratches are considered to be normal. Uh, and when we are working with animals, if we can diminish their fear, anxiety, and stress by using the educational materials that are provided by Fear Free, we can make things safer for the animal physically and emotionally, and we can improve our own safety as well. So. And I think one thing that we're all three of us are passionate about, and that's why we're all um, f fear free enthusiasts, uh, is that what you said, animals actually do have their own internal world. And it's different than the human internal world. So um, you, I wanted to take that opportunity to bring up your book because what what you really focused on in your book is that uh, it's a two way street. We, I, the human animal bond is not just about us receiving all of the time from our pets, but to have a really uh, quality relationship, we need to give and understand. So tell me more about that. Well, you know, for us in behavior and training, like the book that you're talking about, Cooperative Veterinary Care, we really wanted to open up the idea of everything is a conversation between you and the pet. And when I ask the pet a question through my actions, through how I look at them, how I talk to them, how I approach them, how I touch them, what I do with them, each interaction is really a question I'm asking the animal. Are you ready for this? Do you understand what's coming next? Can I make this easier for you to understand? And then I need to pause and I need to look for that answer. And they can't talk to us necessarily, but they can communicate through how close they want to be how they want to look at us, what their expression is, what their physical demeanor is, what their muscle tension level is, what all of those body language signals are. They're giving us lots and lots of information. We just have to slow down for a second, take the time and ask the question, get the answer, take that answer and let it inform the next question that we ask. Let that inform our next interaction with them. So Monique, is that a book really for veterinary professionals or can someone without a veterinary background uh, get with that, read the, the lexicon of the book. So we tried to make the book approachable by anyone. It specifically was uh, written through the veterinary channel, like it was released as a veterinary textbook. But the intention of myself and my co-author, uh, Elisa Howell, was to make sure that it was approachable by anyone. I have lots of pet owners come to me and they end up buying the book and it comes with over a hundred videos as well. So we demonstrate step-by-step -step how to do things. And we have lots of pet owners that are uh, really enjoying it because they take it home and they read it and they watch the videos and they skip over some of the medical stuff that's not as important to them. And they do their homework and they get these animals ready for us. It's kind of amazing. So like, in this moment when maybe you've seen everything you ever wanted to see on Netflix or Amazon Prime, Oh, uh, what, learning about uh, animal behavior from from your videos and your book could really be a good use of your time. That you, I find, I learn so much about people and my children and my relationships by being more aware and sensitive about cues and the language that is used in animal behavior really helps to break down just the process of reading another being. Absolutely, and you know it's. We have a Facebook group also called Cooperative Veterinary Care, and we get a lot of really nice discussion in there among pet owners and particularly connecting pet owners with veterinary professionals because our group is about a 50-50 split. People who are in the veterinary profession and outside the veterinary profession. And uh, it's amazing sometimes to watch how that discussion unfolds and see that, watch them like be sensitive to each other's needs and be nice to each other and help each other learn. It's heartwarming, really. 
it's pretty yeah. great. You know, Monique, people say my cat doesn't say anything to me. My cat is never communicating with me. I would say your cat is always, almost always communicating with you. And and the same for dogs. And they're always looking for us for answers. They're always asking questions. You're both shaking your head, but but tell me more. So Every, every behavior has a function. Uh, Susan Friedman is somebody who I have a great deal of respect for, and she constantly reminds me of this, that every behavior has a function. Everything that an animal does, everything that a human does, we do it because there is some kind of outcome that drives that behavior. And the behaviors that animals use to communicate, it has a function, the function is communication. So if they are choosing to come up and look at us a certain way, they're like, hi, He's saying, oh, the dog, cat can't talk to me. You know, the cat just said, hi. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Finish, right? The cat comes walking up to you and they have their nice little curly Q question mark tail. And look and rub and look and rub. They're saying, hi, I like you. I'm interested. Let's interact, right? And you, or you walk towards the cat and the cat looks and then walks away and goes and lays on the couch. The cat's saying, I'd rather go lay on the couch right now. You know, they are, it's not random what they do. There's an order to their behaviors and they are really trying to communicate what they want, what they don't want, what they like, what they dislike, what's important to them and what's less important. And they communicate all of that through their behavior. But I think in a way, it's like learning a foreign language. You know, if you're speaking French and I don't understand French, I'm like, she's, I don't know, she's not talking about anything. But it's because I don't know how to interpret what you're trying to tell me. And I think that we shouldn't necessarily expect as human beings to understand the communication systems of other species. It's not innate to understand interspecies communication. It actually takes work and effort. I happen to think it's extremely rewarding, interesting, easy, engaging work, but it does take work to understand the differences so that you can start to, you know, speak cat and speak dog and really understand what they're trying to tell us all the time. But the important thing, the important point I'd like to make about what you just said, and I completely agree, it is like learning a foreign language. Yeah. It's not native to us. First point is it's hard for humans to even understand each other. And we allegedly speak the same language, right? <laughs> so even if the language was the same, still, I think we would have miscommunication sometimes, but it's not a mystical power. So people will often say to veterinary professionals or trainers, oh, you have a special way with dogs or you have a way with animals. It's <laughs> While I would love to believe that I'm special and magical in that way, it's really not true. This is a series of observational skills, mechanical skills, and uh, knowledge that all come together and anyone can learn how to communicate with dogs or cats or horses or rats. Anything with a mind can learn and communicate. And we can learn all of that if we just take the time to develop the knowledge and the observation and mechanical skills to do so. So I have a question here from Sarah that is actually up both your alleys. I have an 11 year old male Tonkinese, I love Tonkinese, who recently started peeing outside the litter box. He pees on soft cat beds placed in the living room couch where he and his siblings like to rest on a granite countertop and now on my pillow We've been working closely with my vet for six months and has been mostly under control, specifically urinary prescription food, Prozac, water fountains, exercise wheel, etc. He does not have a UTI, crystals or stones, tested several times, radiology or x-rays are perfect. Uh, but this started recently when he was weaned off Prozac. We are getting him back on the medication. Vets stated that this is idiopathic cystitis. Uh, and a behavioral issue. In the meantime, what advice do you have? Now, I know you can only give general advice here, even though this is specific, there are still lots of questions that you would ask, I'm sure, if, if, if really we could interact directly with Sarah. But given the time constraint that we have for both of you, because this is truly both, up, both in your wheelhouse, I'm curious about what you think about this. It's really hard to uh, to answer. Um, I'm going to start with the the medical side. You know, she talked about a thorough workup of the urinary tract. I don't know if they took culture. She didn't specifically state that. But in an 11 year old cat, there are a few other things that we want to think about that could be medical. We would want to do blood work that included a workup of the the thyroid 
to make sure that um, that it's not a metabolic problem or an endocrine problem of some kind. Um, we think about diabetes, we think about kidney disease, we think about thyroid, and then sometimes we'll find something unexpected. Uh, inappropriate urination has so many different causes. So we wanna make sure that we think about all the medical causes. A medical cause people don't think about a lot in cats, even veterinarians. I have to say, this is new for me. And I have my 20 year reunion this year um, is pain. Cats are so agile and incredible and athletic and uh, um, innately disinclined to show any pain that if your 11 year old cat is having trouble getting in or out of the litter box um, or really just suffering from pain and they might show that um, discomfort by urinating outside the litter box. And then we, if we rule all those things out, then we get to the behavioral things. Agreed. And, you know, in any patient, behavioral changes are almost always a diagnosis of exclusion. And what that means is it's a really fancy long sentence of sentence way of saying, rule out everything that we possibly can with straightforward testing options. And when that's the only thing left on the table, then we'll focus all of our energy on that. Uh, treating and treating unwanted elimination in cats is always multiple problems. There's, it's always multi-factor and it's unique to every single cat situation. I wanna commend you for working so closely with your veterinarian and going down this diagnostic road. Dr. Bales gave a few really good suggestions for things to follow up and maybe consider additional things outside the urinary tract that can cause inappropriate elimination in cats. I will tell you in my personal experience, we have had a number of patients that we ended up linking feline tooth resorption to uh, unwanted eliminations. And that's a diagnosis that can only be made during an anesthesia event where they have dentistry with dental radiographs. And we ended up taking care of that. I'm not saying in any way that that's what's, in, that your cat is afflicted with that, but I just wanted to toss that in addition to your pain and osteoarthritis pain that Dr. Bales was talking about. Dental disease and dental pain can be related to changes in behavior too. And Almost as if on cue, Tech, uh, veterinary technician Vicky Byard just signed in to say hello to you, Monique. Vicky uh, and I worked together many years ago, and she uh, she's responsible for teaching me what I know about dentistry. Um, veterinarians learn from technicians often, and uh, I learned a lot from Vicky. And so, dental pain is something that, particularly in cats. You, you really often can't tell at all unless you examine the mouth and take take those dental x-rays you were talking about. Absolutely. And I mean, 70% of cats age seven or older have tooth resorption that's invisible on physical exam. So, so really no, t t tooth resorption is pretty unique to cats. So if you are human or have, or have kids, you might not know about it. We think about cavities. Yeah. Do you want to explain what tooth resorption is? Uh, with Vicky Byard watching, I don't know if I can <laughs> <laughs> tooth resorption, but essentially tooth resorption is a process where we have destruction of the root of the tooth and it becomes incorporated with the surrounding bone. And that can happen of the tooth root. That's the invisible one that we can only see on x-rays or it can affect the crown of the tooth and that manifests as holes in the tooth that bleed and that hurts. Uh, the ones that are under the gum line, we think a lot of those hurt too. And so all of those deserve to be treated. I will say that we see in our practice plenty of tooth resorption in dogs. And it is also recognized in humans, but we don't think about it in humans that much. Uh, but it does, it certainly afflicts dogs, but cats are the poster child for tooth resorption. Uh, we don't really know what causes it. If we could have cured it, we would have done it by now. That's for sure. Even, Egypt, even mummified cats in Egypt show evidence of tooth resorption. Big cats get it. Small cats get it. Uh, but it's something that should be screened for as part of every cat's overall wellness to make sure that their dental health is taken into consideration as well as the rest of their body. So getting back to this behavior yeah. issue, because we kind of veered off a little bit, um, I guess tooth resorption is certainly possible. Your point, though, is you really need to overall look at the big picture. But let's say it is a behavior issue. We still don't know because there's not enough. So it could be an intracat issue because we don't know how these cats are getting along with one another. It could be a litter box issue. It could be, it could be, it could be. There's a long list here. What I do want to get at, though, is the possibility. Note, he says, possibility that enrichment has something to do with this. And besides, by enriching the environment for these cats, there's no downside 
So talk, if you can, Monique, about what enrichment is. And then I'm sure, because I know her well enough to know, that Dr. Bales will jump afterwards and, and add to the answer, because she is quite expert on this area as well. Uh, Dr. Bales is definitely an expert on this particular topic, without any doubt. But when we talk about enrichment from a behavior perspective, we talk about providing animals with the opportunity to do all of their normal range of behaviors as part of their everyday life. Uh, the one that I think people mostly think about most commonly when we talk about enrichment is ways of feeding animals or giving them things with which they can interact, climb on, smell, experience, stretch out, do all the things that they normally would be able to do. Uh, usually that requires a little bit of extra thought and effort when we're talking about pets that live in homes with people, because if we think about the, num the amount of ground a cat would cover on their own, that's not going to happen when they're living in an apartment. Or if we talk about the number of uh, social interactions that a dog would have on a daily basis if they were free to do what they what they would normally do as a dog, that doesn't happen ordinarily in a pet situation. So enrichment is really providing them exercise for their brain, exercise for their social needs to make sure that they have the opportunity to do all the stuff that a dog or a cat or a horse or a cow or a pig or a rat would get to do as close as we possibly can on a regular basis. And you know, I I am a, a, um, a student of words as well. And when I first started learning about this subject, um, enrichment seemed like the right word. And I think it was because we were all learning it from the beginning. We didn't know. But now that we understand what, what that means and how important it is, I really think that we should sort of get together and have a brainstorm about how to change the language. Because enrichment to me seems like an option, a toy, can yes. an option. Yes, yes. Um, I just wrote a piece that came out in uh, uh, Modern Cat magazine. Uh, Ooh, modern. Saying, um, so the pandemic has been hard and you've been stuck in your house with nothing to do. Your cat feels like that all the time. And you can see, I think it really helps for people when we can relate our experience to someone else's experience to get specific empathy, um, to think about, you know, they don't even have Netflix. They don't <laughs> have, That's uh, right. they, can't, they can't Zoom. They can't go on Facebook. They don't have really, if we don't put it in their world, they don't have it. And the human home, the way we set it up, usually is pretty much completely devoid of what a cat needs to be happy and healthy. Um, so, uh, I hope that everybody reads it and just gives you a little food for thought, but, but I don't think it's optional. And I think it's time that we start to be more assertive about making sure people understand that. So it's, it's crazy that you say this because I began, I just wrote and there's no way, are you in my computer? I don't think there's any way. I've hacked you, Steve. Actually, I've been in your apartment, so. <laughs> I don't think there's any way that you could have seen this catster story that I just filed. And I talked to uh, uh, Michael Delgado and uh, um, who else did I talk? Oh, Kelly Valentine for the story. These yeah. the, the PhD behaviorist and a veterinary behaviorist. And and I had input myself, of course, because I've been talking about enrichment, as Dr. Bales knows, and I think you know, Monique. I think longer than Monique's been alive at this point. But I've been talking. <laughs> What was that? Maybe, but not quite that long. <laughs> yeah, I've been, I've been talking about this for a long time. So so uh, the, the point is that I said the same exact thing. We have got to come up with a way of putting this because it sounds like this is something that's nice enough for your cat. And it is, but it's more important than that. It's necessary. This should, you get a cat, adopt a cat from a shelter, purchase a pedigree cat, whatever. One just walks into your house, should come with a sign my life must be enriched. Yeah. So I can't agree more. And it's so odd because I just said this. So Dr. Bales. I think you're going to need to add me to the interview. But, um, you know, when, when I was a kid and even, you know, 10 years into my veterinary career, I thought a litter box is the size of a postage stamp, that a bowl, at, you know, those now my least favorite thing in the entire world, the bowl that is the food and the water attached to each other. Um, maybe let's put them right next to the litter box. And that's kind of it. 
you're lucky if some tin foil falls on the floor and you can play with that or like a cricket comes in the house you can play with that but that was really acceptable cat care and um, we know so much more about how just that just setting up their their living environment think of your house like an enclosure at the zoo um, so many people feel really passionately about zoo animals that they shouldn't be confined and that they're, you know, well, your house, if you don't work pretty hard at it, is like a barren jail cell for your pets. And um, I argue zoos do a better job than most of us do with dogs and cats. So I agree. Uh, Dr. Bales. Yes. What happens when four veterinary technicians walk into a bar? A lot of stuff. I hope no, that's no, no, not that me. I hope that's not about me. Let me, <laughs> let me ask in another way altogether. So uh, these conferences have been canceled all over the place. And one veterinary technician, who I know you know, said, I have an idea. And then contacted Monique. But Monique, I want you to tell the story. And what you guys have done is incredible. My hope is there are some veterinary professionals that are hearing this and that there's still time to sign up for what we're talking about. But I'll let you explain. Well, uh, good news, there absolutely is still time good. to sign up for uh, Vet Team Global Stream. Uh, this is the brainchild of four veterinary technicians, Becky Mosser, myself, Julie Legred, and Jade, Jade Velasquez. And all of us are educators in addition to being veterinary technicians. And we travel to conferences and we meet attendees and we have a wonderful time and it's so rewarding and talk about enrichment. It's so enriching for our lives to be part of that. And all these cancellations started to come through because of the pandemic. And as educators, we really were losing out on the opportunity to connect with attendees. And as veterinary professionals, they're losing the opportunity to do their CE that they need and enjoy. And so Becky and I sent back and forth a flurry of frantic text messages that led to us founding our own veterinary conference. So this weekend, May 16th and 17th, we will be hosting the first ever fully online virtual veterinary conference. Uh, we are giving, offering 50 lectures. How many? Five zero. <laughs> 50 talks. And um, tell, tell, tell us who some of the speakers are. I mean, this is incredible who these guys got to talk. It's amazing. Kind of the A plus list. Every time, I, so I kind of was the speaker wrangler for this event. And every time I would get a yes in my inbox, I would have like a moment, <laughs> like a moment. You know, I email Marty Becker, Dr. Marty Becker, can you please talk at this conference that nobody's ever heard of or tried before? We're doing this totally new thing and we're not quite sure if it's going to work, but hey, do you want to do it? And he's like, of course. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Hey, Dr. Andy Work. How would you like to participate in this new thing nobody's ever done before? It's going to be great. And he's like, sure, that sounds awesome. I'm like, okay, amazing. That's terrific. And I said, you know, hey, Tasha McNerney. Hey, Megan Brashear. Hey, Steven Sattal. Hey, Heather Hopkinson. Hey, all of the A-listers in veterinary medicine. Would you like to sign up? We would love to have you speak. And every one of them said yes. I think the one where I had like the biggest kind of who am I and whose life is this is when I emailed Temple Grandin. I said, hey, we're putting on this event. It's going to be like this. And here's what we're thinking. And uh, my phone rings. And I thought, who's calling me from Colorado? And I answer the phone and it's Temple Grandin. I said, hey, I'm Monique. Yep, that's me. <laughs> he says, I would love to be in your event. And I'm so excited. And I think it's such a great idea. So even Temple Grandin is excited about what we're doing. She's going to give two hours of interactive Q&A, talking all about um, cattle and equine. So, and so how's it going to work technologically? Because it's, it's really a miracle that you pulled that off this quickly. So if someone signs up, how's it going to... We hope. I'm sure you. I'm sure you have it all sorted out. But how's it going to work? What's it look like? What What it's going to look like is the. It's going to look similar to what you you and we are doing right now, actually. So attendees will have the opportunity to interact by typing in questions, and uh, present presenters will have the opportunity to interact with the attendees in real time. They'll be able to see video of the presenter, and they'll be able to see video of the presentation. So we'll be all providing you with a PowerPoint or keynote or that kind of thing, as well as proceedings will be provided digitally. Uh, but there will be four tracks, so four rooms. 
and you can select which lecture you go to and enter that room and you and all the other attendees that are interested in that topic will be listening live in real time to the presenter and ask your questions, get your answers, get your CE. And then we are also having on Saturday night, we're having a concert with Vet Tech Kelsey. So she's going to perform and that's going to be super fun. And on Sunday morning, we're having a brunch toast with the Bridge Club. So oh, that's great. Brenda. The glass together with our attendees on Sunday. Uh, we won't be able to be in the same place as one another, but we can have the same experience as one another. And that's what we're really trying to foster. So attendees can interact with each other virtually through video and through chat, and they can interact with the presenters as well. So I know, Monique, you have some corporate sponsors to help you to make this possible to do. But but that's different than a corporation saying, I'm going to do this instead because we're bigger and better. Or one of the conferences that you and I and, and Dr. Bales love, VMX, or what are they called now? It's not WVC anymore. It's... Oh. Leviticus. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I've got to learn that one now. Or, <laughs> but, but it could or ABMA. I mean, any of the, they're great. They are great, and they could have done some of that. So my question, when she gets back from wherever she went, <laughs> did we just lose our guests? Hello. Okay. I think it was something you said. Question is, it was. <laughs> so what happened? I decided to mow the lawn, and I'm like, uh, can you wait for just a little while? <laughs> <laughs> so my question is. Why did you not go that route and say, us four ladies, and I think I know the answer because I know the four ladies, but at least three of the four, but rather well, but why didn't you go that route? It might have been less pressure, easier. We believed in ourselves that we could do it, is really yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are four people who have enough experience and enough ambition, and we really wanted to pull it off our own way. We wanted to reach attendees that maybe don't have the opportunity to go to big conferences. They may not have the CE budget. They may not have the access. They may have even never gone to a conference before. We have quite a few attendees who have signed up, and this is their first time going to that conference. Like, they've never seen. They don't know who Andy Rourke is. They don't know who Ernie Ward is. They don't even know these presenters. That To us, we're like, oh, it's the A-list of veterinary medicine. It super is. But many of our attendees have never even had the chance to be exposed to those people. And if we went that big conference route or we went that, you know, we went that more conventional route that you're talking about, Steve, we're reaching out to all the same people who always have that opportunity. And we wanted to provide this opportunity equally for everyone. And the way to do that was to keep the reins. You know, and as I think about it, I think that this could be a model for the future. So hopefully life will get back to normal. We'll have our conferences to speak at again, right? Um, you did have to scrounge around for a couple of speakers, which is why you chose me. But you also got, but you also got Susan Friedman, who is just a guru in in the training world, right? Yeah. Or you could just stop your sentence with guru. <laughs> Susan Friedman is phenomenal. Um, I used to fangirl over Susan Friedman all the time, and now I consider her my friend. And like that's the that's the miracle of life, right? Like that's the miracle of networking and connecting with people and having passion and sharing passion with people. Is you your world just gets so much bigger and so much more rewarding. And Susan is a part of that in my life for sure. But uh, there's no one better for me for breaking things down and explaining them in a way that is scientifically super rigorous, but also very approachable so that you can apply what you learn from her in your everyday life with any kind of animal, human or otherwise, like the next day. I mean, everything she gives is so accurate, but so practical and delivered with love. Like. <laughs> I'm sold. I'm sold. I, I need to, I need to sign up. So Kim, Kim, when we're done, I want to put a link beneath this live. So registration is, is easy for people to be able to go down and just click onto your registration page. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And you know what, Monique, I want to celebrate what you just said, because I think that we're living in a time that's super overwhelming and um, problems seem like they're coming out at us at a biblical clip, um, but what you said was we thought we could do it, so we did, and we believed in ourselves. And I think that I'm seeing right now amazing leadership from people who have decided they're gonna be the one to make the difference and not wait for somebody else to do it. 
and it's not easy and it makes you vulnerable and maybe you lose a bunch of money, who knows? It's risky to not, you won't. Maybe I did. Um, but uh, <laughs> but it's risky to uh, to try something new and to put yourself out there and to go for it and to have the confidence to say, yeah, I'll get all the best speakers and yeah, some you know I'm gonna build it and they're gonna come and here's how it goes. So I just want to say bravo because I hope that in and of itself inspires um, everyone who's listening to this to think maybe I can do that thing that I keep saying someone should. Maybe that's someone's me. Well, the other thing before, Monique, I even give you a chance to answer, uh, I want to add to that because here we have four women doing it. And there are, I'm sure, some who would say that couldn't be done because it's four women. I hope not, but I think that's reality. And, and also that you guys are only technicians. Well, anyone who says that sure hasn't the hell met you guys. But, but what technicians are capable of should never be doubted. Uh, and everyone should be at the same level. I think you are not just saying it like I just did with words. You're showing that. That's so sweet. He's so nice to us. But, mm. you know, it, it's fraught with risk. I mean, everything feels uncomfortable when you're doing something new, right? Like you, Dr. Bales was talking about vulnerability. Whew. You got to really be, you got to really put yourself out there. And that takes practice. And you have to understand that if you go to that vulnerable place, you're opening the door for failure and you're opening the door for disappointment. You're opening the door for hurt and for losing money and all the things. But the other thing you're doing is you're opening the door for the possibility of success and something really amazing. And if you never open that door, you definitely can never walk through it. And I feel super grateful and just blessed to be walking down this new road and blazing a trail that's never been walked before in veterinary medicine. And you know, when we got together and we thought we'd put this event together, we're scouring the internet, right? Somebody has to have done this before. Somebody has to have thought of this before us. Somebody else is doing this. And now there are more of their popping up, right? But I think we were first. And I think ours is gonna be awesome. Well, it's going to be awesome. Yeah, I can't help but be with these speakers. I think you also bring up a very important point. There are lots of people in the veterinary field who are part-time employees. Never mind the pandemic. They are unable to, and you alluded to this a bit, but I want to make a point of this. The, and perhaps it's one of you watching who's unable to go to Vegas to the biggest conference uh, called now Viticus or VMX, which they say they're the biggest conference in Orlando, but they're both very big is the point, and never have the opportunity to see these speakers that you're rattling off the names of. They might not even know who they are necessarily, as you mentioned. Maybe they can't get away because of family obligations. Maybe they can't get away because of finances. And if the veterinary practice isn't paying for you to go, it's not a cheap trip to make because you have to pay for the hotel, all that. Uh, maybe it's because of other life obligations because mom and dad are living with you. Whatever it might be, to me, the other nice thing is, all you have to do is go into like, I'm in my living room now, all you have to go is whatever room you choose and go online like we are now. And and I think what you're doing is going to have stickiness, if that's a word, and it will be around for a very long time. And everyone who comes to your conference is going to have the best seat in the house. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know what? We were talking before we went live tonight about um, speaking and getting feedback from the attendees. Um, that often includes things that the speaker can't control, like the room temperature or what's served at lunch. <laughs> and yes. now, everyone who comes to your conference is going to have the room exactly how they want it and whatever they want for lunch. So they can just put all those um, sort of domestic concerns to rest and really dig into the incredible information that they're gonna hear from these world-class speakers. And Melinda brought up a great point that I think I talked to uh, Julie about at some point in time when she told me about this idea, one of the one of the super four. Um, and that is it's accessible to everybody. And we're talking about accessibility as well. So people with limitations, whatever they might be, who physically may have a problem walking or getting around at some of these giant conferences, but even some of the smaller ones or even getting on an airplane because they're afraid of flying, whatever it might be. 
Uh, Melinda, you have a very good point about that. And it's accessible financially. You did that too. We tried. You know, Dr. Bales was talking about how uh, there's a real financial strain in veterinary medicine. So we did try to keep registration really approachable and affordable for what people are receiving. We are fully race approved for all 50 talks. So for on DVM and technicians. So DVMs and technicians can all get race approved CE for this. And you also, the one thing that I always want when I go to a conference is I look at the program and I circle the things I want to go to, or I like mark my talk so I don't forget to show up and I look next to it and there's something I want to see so mm -hmm. bad. But for a year, you can go back and watch all the recordings if you're registered. Oh, that's amazing. You don't have to miss any talk. That's <laughs> you know, amazing. We have them. But uh, we, speaking of accessibility, Steve mentioned this. This year, uh, our accessibility maybe isn't quite what we are hoping, but next year we are gonna make sure that we have closed captioning available and we're also gonna have translation services so it can be in a variety of different languages. So, um, and, and I'll give myself a quick plug. I know I'm talking about millennials uh, and what millennials are looking for on veterinary visits. Uh, and I'm also, I think, talking about separation distress. Uh, so as all of this unfolds, we are going to see in dogs, we're beginning to see it already, more separation anxiety. How to identify that and what to do about it and products you can use to help you as well as behavior modification. Those will be two things I am going to be talking about. Uh, I wanna read if there's one more question here. Um, yeah, I mean, oh, Paula, hi. So, so uh, hi, Paula. You know Paula too, I think. Uh, Liz, I've seen her on your Facebook page anyway, I think so. Um, yeah, I mean, missing the personal and physical interaction, absolutely true. But the way you've set this up, and I don't know exactly how this will work, but you promise there will be that kind of interaction. And and some people will actually feel more comfortable with that. As, as much as we possibly can. And part of that has to be attendee driven. So just like when you go to a regular conference, there's going to be the people who are sitting in the hallways one by one on the couch with their earbuds in that choose not to interact. And that's very easy on this platform, but choosing to interact is also very simple. And so the inter level of interaction can be as much or as little as people want to choose to do. You know, I was thinking about um, NAVC uh, and some of the lectures you mentioned, um, like Andy Rourke, the, the rooms aren't big enough. And, and for, um, lots of the people that you mentioned. So I have been to those lectures, like Tasha, uh, sitting in the hallway. I can't even see them, but sometimes they'll have a teleprompter in the hallway. Um, so to be able to really be able to hear and see and have that kind of access, uh, it's just so awesome. What a great idea. The last little plug I will give about the conference experience for, for VCGS is that the first thousand people who register are also getting their swag bag mailed to them to their house. So wow. you also get free stuff. Free, free, <laughs> free free is free. To the vet conference, right? You go and you get your cool stuff. We're going to send the cool stuff to you since you can't fly to where the cool stuff is. That's amazing. That's amazing. And free indeed is my favorite four letter word. So, uh, we're gonna put up a link, but again, you have a Facebook page. What is the name of the conference? Vet Team Global Stream 2020, VTGS. Vet Team Global Stream 2020, which implies right there, there's gonna be a 2021, a 2022, et cetera. Congratulations, truly. I think we're just about out of time, Dr. Bales. Is there yeah. anything else that you wanna no, jump No, I just wanna say that the profession is better for having you both in it, so thank you. Oh. And I'm really looking forward to um, this conference and uh, all the great behavior stuff that you're you're putting out all the time, both of you. So thank you. Um, it really makes my week to be able to interact and have this hour with such amazing people and to connect on this level. So it's it's a privilege and thank you. And my pal Julie points out there's an exhibit hall too. And in fact, I am told that I will be on exhibit. And and that you're going to auction me off or something like that? Well, the plus wow. side is it's a small box to send you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm making that up. All right. Uh, thank but you we so very. Can go to the exhibit. I say that again. We do have exhibitors, and you can absolutely visit with them in the exhibit. Absolutely. All right. Thank. Have you. a great night. Stay safe, everybody. Bye. Thank you, Monique Fairchild. Thank you, Moni. Congratulations.